So tonight, we are very happy to have Tay Tong Fat back with us. So for those who hasn't known Tay, uh, his ordained name is Tiktrot Tong Fat. Address him as Tay. He's a South Australian living in Gladstone, a small town in the Southern Flinders Ranges. And he's 70 years old and has had a long and varied career in the human services. So they fully ordained in September 2005, and he has worked as a university chaplain and offer uh, contemplative care in the area of palliative care. And since 2007, he has trained in clinical pastoral education and has worked until 2021 as a supervisor and educator of chaplains in training. So over the last year, he has been discerning a new path for his life with the help of much solitude and silence, the support of a spiritual director and engaging in a nine-month course with the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care, a program in offering contemplative care from a Buddhist perspective. And he has recently relocated to a camper van in Adelaide and engaged in the support of his sister-in-law and his younger brother, who was suffering from vascular dementia and inoperable pancreatic cancer. He's there to teach his brother meditation, to be with him as he dies, and to conduct his funeral. Sadly, this brother passed away um, slightly more than a week ago. And in fact, his funeral was this morning. So I invite you all to send our thoughts and our condolences to Tay and his family, as well as to KK's brother. And Tay, we are so grateful that you are here with us tonight, despite the sad and unfortunate event that has just happened to your brother. And despite that, you are here with us tonight. So we're so grateful, Tay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So maybe we will start with a little meditation um, or just coming back to where we are in whatever room we're in. And that will help calm us and bring us back into the present because we probably all have busy days or, or I certainly have. So um, that would be good. I'll invite the bell. I hope you can hear it. I know that bells don't work very well on Zoom, but we'll try. So let's begin with um, perhaps about 10 minutes of meditation. Find a way to sit comfortably, either on the floor or in your chair or wherever you're sitting. Make sure that your back is straight, but not too much like a ramrod. Um, just rather than leaning back like this or trying to be very... Um, how can I call it, um, rigid. You just sit with your back nice and straight and your shoulders relaxed. And like give yourself, sit with your eyes closed, your hands folded in your lap, as you're almost, as I think you're all experienced meditators, just find the comfortable way that you sit when you meditate. And perhaps take three lovely deep breaths to help um, calm you.
and bring your attention to your in-breath and your out-breath, wherever you most easily recognize your breath. Maybe it's as you breathe in through your nostrils and out through your nostrils, or maybe it's um, in your abdomen. If you put your hands on your abdomen and feel your breath entering your body and leaving your body with your abdomen expanding and contracting, or maybe it's with the rising and the falling of your chest, breathing in and feeling your chest rise, breathing out and feeling your chest, or feeling your chest expand and breathing out and feeling your chest contract. Wherever you most readily find your breath, put your attention there and breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Allowing yourself to be present to yourself. Putting aside all of the demands and the expectations of the day, letting go of all of those demands and expectations and just relaxing and resting. Being grateful for the peace and the calm surrounding us tonight. Noticing the peace and the calm in the room that you're sitting in. Being grateful for your in-breath and your out-breath, for the life that you continue to have. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathing in, I know that I am alive. Breathing out, I am grateful for this experience of life. Breathing in, breathing out, calming the mind, resting the body. Breathing in, breathing out. Keeping your attention on the in-breath and the out-breath.
breathing in being calm noticing calm arising breathing out enjoying the peace of the early evening breathing in breathing out paying attention to your in breath and your out breath So good evening. I hope everyone is well and happy tonight. I'm coming to you from another venue, a different venue tonight. Um, I'm staying in Adelaide. In um, my my GP is a, a lovely Vietnamese Buddhist woman, and she and her husband built um, a big kind of area above their their um their practice which is largely a library i call it the buddhist library for south australia and it's got a beautiful room for meditation and for um for ceremonies and then it's also got a, a bedroom and a kitchen and a bathroom and toilet so that um it's available for monks and nuns to stay here and as I'm usually the only monk or nun <laughs> who comes by, I get to stay here very comfortably and happily with thanks to my doctor. So that's where I'm coming to you from, coming to you from tonight. Is everybody there? Hello? Yes, they, you can, oh, good. Um, okay. yeah, because they unmute yeah. themselves so that it's, it's it okay. don't disturb yeah. you. Well, I just, Thank All you. I could see was myself, and I got a bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tonight's Dhamma talk comes in two parts. One is the um, the first part is the the Dhamma talk, although nobody knew it as the Dhamma talk, but the introduction or the or the talk I gave today at my brother's. Um, well, my sister-in-law didn't want to call it a funeral. So it got called a celebration of life. I didn't feel particularly celebratory, but it turns out that um, it was a really lovely day of being with friends and or being particularly with the family and friends and a lovely time of really um, respectful recognition of my brother's life. Um, I'm, my brother was, is not a religious person at all. 
so I was asked not to include any prayers or, <laughs> excuse me, any prayers or anything like that. So um, I did my best to be um, religiously non-religious, if you like. I introduced today um, by mentioning to everyone that was there, and there must have been about 70 or 80 people, that um, my mother's parents got married 103 years ago. And my father's parents got married 108 years ago. So our families, the two families that made up my brother, were over 100 years old. And today there were five generations of people in attendance, apart from my parents, who weren't there, of course. There were, um, my, there was um, my generation, no, yeah. There was my generation and the next generation on, um, the generation of our children, and then the next generation, our grandchildren. So we represented five generations of these two small families. And it was very lovely um, to notice after over a hundred years that we are still meeting together, more often now than not at funerals, but still meeting together as a family and taking an interest in each other's lives and being glad to see one another and noticing the progress of old age. <laughs> Everybody's looking a little older, all my, all my cousins are looking older and I'm looking a little older. Um, and there are now children who are um, up to 10 years of age who are the, the fifth generation from our grandparents. So it was lovely to be with people and to, um, enjoy a relaxed period of time, um, just reflecting on my brother's life and basically on what a good person my brother was. Um, there were three people who gave eulogies. One was my cousin, who was very close to my brother. My cousin has a lovely sense of humor, so there were lots of laughs and enjoyment. And then my brother's neighbor across the road, um, whom, he and his wife called their stepdaughter and she gave three lovely speeches. And my sister-in-law wrote a really nice little poem to her husband and that was repeated. And then I gave this talk that I'm about to give you. My brother died on, oh, when was it? I think it was um, the 10th of June, I think. It was a Friday and he had been admitted to the hospice at the Flinders Medical Center called the, uh, um, what's it called? I can't remember, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted today. <laughs> uh, the, the Laurels Hospice at the Flinders Medical Center. He died there almost a fortnight, a fortnight ago on Friday. And his death was very peaceful. He, um, as as Meredith suggested, he had um, pancreatic cancer. Um, he was given six months to live and he lasted four weeks. Um, and we were all a bit glad of that because six months of pancreatic cancer is a lot of really unnecessary suffering. But he, he went after four weeks and he was surrounded by the people who loved him. So that was a good, a good, a good, um, Good death, really. But since then, and over these last 11 days or so, since my brother died, um, I've gone through many feelings. I've mostly felt a quiet kind of sorrow. And I've been very tired. And I've been touched by many small things in the world around me, noticing small things that remind me of the precious nature of life and the precious nature of my brother's life. I've also, interestingly enough, experienced a lot of anger, um, almost furious anger. Mind you, I didn't act on it, but I noticed it very powerfully. And it's given me something to really reflect on. How come there is this anger as part of my grief? What is this anger about? Um, and so that's, a little job I've got to do over the next month or so, a couple of months is to 
sit again with that anger. It hasn't arisen since this afternoon, but um, it, it may, but I don't think so. It was just there in the proceedings up to today, which was his funeral. And I've just assumed that the anger, which really shocked me at times, um, was part of the grief that I feel for my brother's passing. Um, but I haven't felt any terrible grief, like throwing myself about crying and those kind of things. That may yet come because my sorrow may take time to unfold. The reason for this grief, I know, is because I have loved my brother since before he was born. He was my baby brother and I became his father 1B. He had his natural dad, but he had his big brother too, who always felt fatherly towards him. And I've come to understand from talking with other people that that's quite natural, quite normal, really, that the oldest child is quite often, um, especially for the youngest child, um, a parent figure. And, and we feel that parent, parental feeling towards the younger child. So in the early part of winter in 1959, my dad built a fire in the fireplace at our home in the little suburb we lived in called Pennington. My parents, my sister and I sat and thought through the names that the new baby might be given. At that time, my dad was reading a book to me every night called Pinocchio. My dad used to work and have to catch the bus to work. And then when he came home through Port Adelaide, he'd stop in Port Adelaide, go into Coles and find a new book for me each week. And then he'd come home and we'd read that book that week. Well, this time we were reading Pinocchio, which is a pretty famous Italian based story. And out of that story, my father suggested we might call the baby Geppetto. And Geppetto was the father of Pinocchio, or the man who made Pinocchio. It was just a joke, but it was fun, and, I never, and I've never forgotten it. But in the end, my mother had decided on the name Joy, which was a, is a lovely name, if the baby was a girl. And if the baby was a boy, he was to be called Craig Keith. Now, interestingly enough, my name is, my given name is Peter, but Craig is a Welsh word and it means a rock. Peter is a Greek word and it means a rock. My father's name was Keith and that was a Scottish word and that meant one who dwelt among the rocks. <laughs> so it was lovely to recognize that my brother, my dad and I all belonged together right from the very beginning of our lives. We were all rocky types of people or people who dwelt among rocks. On Tuesday, July 22nd in 1959, my mum and dad had hired a TV set it and set it up in the lounge room. It was the very beginning of television arriving in South Australia. And they set the television up in the lounge room and invited all the neighbours around to watch TV that night. Probably a test pattern or something like that. Early in the morning of July 23rd, the next morning, my mum was taken off to Belmont Hospital in a little suburb, a seaside suburb called Largs Bay. And the hospital was just around the corner from where my father was born, actually. And that's where she had my baby brother. And the next morning, our neighbour, whom we used to call Auntie Connie, she came over and gave my sister and me breakfast because we had to go to school and kindergarten. And she announced the birth of our baby, baby brother to us. And she said to me, he looks just like you. <laughs> and I was thrilled because I was so desperate to have a baby brother. And one who looked like me was even better. My brother Craig was loved from the outset. And there is one really beautiful expression of that love that's found in two letters that our grandmother, Nana Hawkins, wrote to dad and mum in 1960, just before she died. My mother kept these two letters over the many years. And 
I found them and I've got them um, secreted in a folder. Um, and I re I've reread them and I thought I might share them with the people today at the funeral. And there are two relevant portions. Dear Keith, Betty and children. Well, here I am at the Walter Hospital at last. I hope you're all doing all right and the children are all well. How is dear little Craig and my darling Cassie, that's my sister, and dear old Peter, that's me. Well, I must say cheerio now, love to all, mum. So those are the words of my much loved grandmother. And then she wrote a second letter. Dear Keith, Betty and children, I have been going to write to you all last week, but I lost my biro for several days and didn't like to buy or borrow one. I hope little Craig is well. He is 11 months old today. Is he crawling properly now? Have you heard anything about the baby food? If not, I'll write, a, I'll write again about it. Love to all from mum. Kiss, 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 and a very big kiss for little Craig. Now, my brother Craig never knew our beautiful grandma, but he grew to love the thought of her with my encouragement. He also loved a photograph of that grandmother and our grandfather and was thrilled recently when one of his support workers made a copy of the photo for him. So you can see that he was surrounded by this love um, at, from the very beginning of his life. My brother was also greatly loved um, by the other side of the family, my mother's side of the family, and he loved them too. He loved my Auntie Joan and, her, and the cousins that came out of her marriage. He loved my Auntie Nancy and the cousins that came out of his, that marriage. And he loved my Uncle Tom and the cousins that came out of that marriage. But for me, one of the most lovely things was the special love he had for our Auntie Glenn, who was my father's sister. And it's special to me because in the end, my parents had a terrible divorce, a very bitter um, divorce that caused a lot of hurt. Um, and it was lovely because even though my mother never allowed us much contact with my father's family, my brother still loved my, my father's sister. And when my brother was at high school, the high school was just around the corner from where this aunt lived. And so every day as he was waiting for the bus to go home, my aunt would sit with him and wait. And she'd always take some nice treats for him to eat. And so he never forgot the love and the care that was offered to him by this aunt. And there's a beautiful photograph we've got of my aunt when she was in the nursing home with, um, she, was, she died at the age of 96. And there's a lovely photo of my brother with his arms around her and um, with a lovely smile on his face. So for me, that was very important that, um, that my brother was able to, to love my father's sister in spite of the bitterness of divorce that happened between my parents. When my brother was very small at Easter time, somebody, I can't remember who, bought him a little yellow rabbit um, full of straw. He was, the rabbit was stuffed with straw and it had a big Easter egg with its, uh, its arms were wrapped around a big Easter egg. And my brother loved that rabbit. He took it everywhere with him until of course the rabbit got so dirty and so broken up that my brother had, had to relinquish it. And so in its place, my mother bought this. This was my brother's blue rabbit. And he had that rabbit from about the age of three or four until he died at the age of 62. And he asked me if I would look after his rabbit when he died. So here we are. And I find it very comforting to cuddle this rabbit, um, thinking of my brother and thinking of the love that my brother had for this rabbit. My brother always really loved my mother's family as well, and was especially close to our grandfather, whose name was William or Bill. When he was young, my father would take my brother and my grandfather mushrooming 
um, my dad was something of a hunter gatherer and um, they would drive the car up into the Adelaide Hills and um, illegally go onto farmers' properties and look for mushrooms and bring them home. And my mum would cook them all up for my dad and we'd eat mushrooms until we looked like mushrooms. Um, and he would take my grandpa, his father-in-law and my brother mushrooming. My grandfather, as I said, his name was William or Bill. We called him Grandpa Bill. And only recently my brother told me that he would rather have been called William instead of Craig. And I understood his, his desire to be called William because that's the name my mother gave me as my second name, William. And I would also have liked my grandfather Hawkins's name, my father's father's name, Alfred, as part of my name. So I could understand my brother's um, wanting his grandfather's name because he really loved his grandpa. My brother was a really beautiful child loving and generous and always close to his family. And he loved animals. He kept chooks until, until he died. The, the chooks are still in the backyard. He, had, he loved cats. We always had cats and, do and dogs. And we had cockies and all kinds, of, all kinds of animals. And my brother loved animals. When he was very small, my brother went to the local, the corner shop, and we used to buy ice creams, a threepenny ice cream, it cost threepence, three cents, something, whatever that was. And he, he bought one one day, my brother got an ice cream and he came home and he squatted down in front of the dog and he'd lick the ice cream, then he'd give the dog a lick, then he'd have a lick, then he had the dog a lick. And I never forgot it. I thought my brother is so lovely. He's so generous with, the, with, our, with our beautiful little dog. Where am I up to here? My brother and I both inherited um, our father's family's sense of humor. Um, and in the end, my brother came to look very much like my father, um, which was quite shocking really, because shocking in the sense that he didn't look like my dad when he was young, but the older he got, the more he looked like dad. And especially when he grew a mustache, he looked just so much like my dad. Um, and like my father, he lacked a certain sense of self-confidence. He didn't really ever feel confident. He didn't ever really feel loved. Um, even though he was a very loving man, very popular, he never seemed to let that in and accept that as part of his, a part of his life experience. So my prayer for him in the last week, the one time I have been able to cry, was praying for him and praying that as he transitions from this life to whatever is ahead, he will be healed of that lack of self-confidence and he will come to be confident in his own true nature. My brother and I loved each other with a very deep brotherly love. We only ever had one argument, which was at Uluru, and I can't, neither of us could, could work out what we argued about and neither of us liked it at all. It took a couple of days for us to be able to be comfortable with each other again. But that is the only argument that we had. We didn't know the, we didn't understand why we had the argument and we didn't like it at all. So that was a very good sign that these two brothers who loved each other couldn't, didn't really like being angry with one another. One of the most exciting nights of my life was a Friday night when my mother had taken my sister to the gymnasium at the church, the local church. And my brother was almost a year old and he'd been standing up, learning to stand up and sit up for a while. And on this particular night, my brother took his first steps. He walked from my dad to me and then back again. And it was just fabulous. It was the most exciting thing to watch my baby brother walk. Not long before he died, maybe a month or two ago, I said to him that I was with him when he took his first steps. And I promised I would be with him when he took his last steps. And I was able to fulfill that promise. When he went into the hospice, um, on the first day, he had to go to the toilet. So I led him into the toilet, holding his hands. He went to the toilet and I led him back to bed. And that was the last time he walked. So I was able to fulfill the promise that I would be there when he took his last steps. And that's a very precious thing for me. 
to, to have. And only a few weeks before he died, he sent me a text message. Quite often, we lay awake at night texting one another, having long conversations on, on the SMS. And um, this, the last text message he ever sent me said, said the following. He said, you have taught me how to spell the word brother. F-R-I-E-N-D. Friend. And I was so touched by that. Um, my brother was being really honest with me and open with me about his feelings. And I thought, well, I'm going to take that thought with me to the grave. My brother and I were similar in many ways, including our politics. We both loved Bob Dylan. Our sense of, we both had the same sense of humor. And the Irish in us meant that we both loved meeting people and talking nonstop. <laughs> Craig was always clear that he and I were the Hawkins boys, the son of our father, the sons of our father. But we were also very different. My brother longed to be married, longed to have a wife and a family, and eventually he got the wife. But I was never interested in marriage. I was not the marrying kind. I love being a university student and teaching and all of those kind of things. But my brother wasn't interested in further education at all. Like my dad, he loved his work in the transport business, driving buses and, and, and that sort of thing. And the connection that, that that brought with other people. I was also religious. And like my mum and dad, my brother could never take to religion. He used to say that if he was going to have a religion, it would be Buddhism. <laughs> but he never, ever took that step, which is just fine. I loved to move about and travel. I had a longing to travel from when I was very young. But my brother was happy to stay at home. He was a homebody. And one day, one of the loveliest things my brother ever said to me was that I was always, that he thought I was always a loner, someone who enjoyed being alone, who was happy to be alone. And I was really touched by that because what it meant was that my brother knew me well. And not only that, but he was unafraid to be honest with me. And I have to remember, I, I recall thinking at the time, that he was one of the few people in the world that I could ever be completely honest with. So our relationship was very close and very dear. And we were very similar and very different. And maybe you have the same kind of relationship with your siblings if you have them. The real sorrow that I have to deal with is less to do with dying and more to do with the way that my brother experienced hurt in his life. He really suffered at the thought of leaving his wife, who was the great love of his life. He died holding her hand tightly. I eventually separated their hands as at my sister-in-law's request. I never had the same fear of death. There is a beautiful haiku or Zen poem that was written by a a Zen practitioner in Hobart, and it says this, starry night, what's left of my life is enough. And that's, that's the sentiment that I hold to, whereas he was much more afraid of death. I'm sorrowful that I will never see my baby brother in the flesh again. But I know, especially from the ongoing love I experience with my family members, my parents, my grandparents, I'm confident that love never ends. Once you love, that's it. I mean, it might turn into, it might for some people turn into indifference or hatred, but it hasn't in my case. And my brother, I believe, will continue always to be alive in my heart. So, for me, in a sense, death isn't real. What is real 
in my experience, is love. Those things that hurt my brother and caused him a lack of sense of, of self-confidence were in part inherited from my father, but also experienced in his life. The destruction of our family life when my father left my mother for another woman. My brother being told that my dad was um, could no longer care for him because he had this other woman's children to look after. There was the fact that he was frightened out of contact with my brother because of my mother's anger. And that the second man that my mother was going to marry turned out to be rather violent alcoholic and used to beat my mother up. My brother used to witness that. And so there were whole chunks of his life that were not happy and caused him to be not happy. My brother was a good and loving and generous and intellectual man, intelligent man, who had a great capacity for understanding and forgiveness. And I'll hold him close to me forever. Now, the last thing that I've realized from this time with my brother, this last, well, 10 years of dementia, he had de vascular dementia for about six or seven years, and he had strokes about 10 years ago, and now the cancer. Um, the, the last thing I want to say about all of this, with that in mind, is that we're all headed towards old age, sickness and death. That's been the subject of the last two, really, of my Dharma talks with you. Um, and we can't avoid it. We cannot avoid death. And death is not a scandal. That's just a natural part of what, what happens in life. It's a reality that we all have to come to terms with. In spite of his pain, my brother's pain, and the separation from his wife and the world he loved, my brother actually had a good death, what I would consider to be a good death. When it was no longer possible for my sister-in-law and myself to care for him, he was put in a hospice. And the treatment he received from the hospice was exemplary. I've worked, I've, my brother was in the hospice here in Adelaide, and I worked as the Buddhist chaplain in the Whittle Ward, which is a hospice in Hobart. And I know from my own experience, these hospices are wonderful places, very good places to die. So he died painlessly and at peace. And equally important, he died surrounded by those who loved him. His wife, his brother and sister, his in-laws, his cousins, his niece, his friends. And if people weren't able to be there in person, they were certainly there in spirit. And this is the story of my brothers getting old, getting sick and dying. And it's the story I told today at his funeral. So briefly, I just want to look at another aspect of all of this stuff. This is the third talk I've given on death, and you'll be relieved to know it's the last one for a little while. Um, but I've described the process of my brother's death. In my view, Buddhists ought not only be concerned with the process of death, but also with the context of death. In Australia, our experience of death, generally speaking, is highly privileged. We have the hospices in everywhere, but certainly I know that we have them in Adelaide and in Hobart. We have put palliative care offered by community palliative care nurses. There are support groups for people dying um, that are run by volunteers, certainly in Tasmania. I'm not sure about South Australia. I haven't been involved in palliative care here. And all the palliative care that's offered um, is offered with a radical inclusion of family and friends in the process. You can stay overnight 
with your beloved one in the in the hospice. If your if your beloved one has a pet, a dog or a cat, um, you can take the dog or the cat in. The um, the hospice is is wanting to enable the person to die in a way that's not altogether dissimilar to the way that person has lived. It takes great care to make sure that the person the person's dying is natural and peaceful and comfortable. So from my point of view, having worked in palliative care and having watched my brother die in, in, a, in a hospice, I want to say that death like birth is not simply a medical fact. It's not simply a medical experience. It is, it is a human experience. Our humanity is touched very deeply when we are with a loved one who is dying, or even when we are working with a person as a chaplain and they're dying. It's a deeply human experience, and it's a human experience that is very privileged. If you've ever been with someone through the period of their dying, you know what a great privilege it is to sit with someone who's dying and to notice that the whole process. And that's the process of dying, but there's also the context of dying, the situation in which people die. And I would say that around the world today, most death that happens in the world doesn't take place in this highly medicalized and privileged context that we assume in Australia, or that we non-Indigenous people in Australia assume, is what I really should say. Let's consider other contexts for death. In the last few years, numbers of children have died as a result of the violence of adult men. In Mel one in Melbourne, Luke Batty in 2014 was actually murdered by his father. But there's a lot of examples of parents literally killing their children. There are many Indigenous Australians who die much sooner than non-Indigenous Australians due to chronic illness. We also know in Australia the phenomenon of deaths in custody. There are many instances of women being raped and beaten and murdered by men. And Jill Mayer and Eurydice Dixon are only two that we know of. Many elderly people and people labelled intellectually disabled die too soon and unhappily because they are not afforded adequate healthcare advocacy. Suicide and fatal car accidents involving drugs and alcohol are far too common in Australia. And of course, there has been the death of Reza Bharati on Manus Island an asylum seeker who died during Australia's watch. Abroad, of course, there are deaths due to war, starvation and famine. There is the current war in Ukraine and the war instigated in part by Vladimir Putin in Syria. There are also the 12 million victims of the Nazi death camps that hang over us in much the same way as the Inquisition hangs over Europeans centuries after it finished. And then there are the deaths that took place in Rwanda and Burundi, Cambodia, Myanmar and Sri Lanka and many other places. The context of much death in the world is in a broad sense political. It's due to sexism or racism or ageism or homophobia or the powerlessness of children and the so-called disabled. It's the result of violence and war. And there are deliberate policies to murder people or even just to let them die. The famines around the world, and I think always of the famine in my ancestral Ireland, perpetrated by the English ruling class, is one example, is one example of deliberate murder, deliberate killing, delib um, unnecessary and deliberate killing. And an argument has been put forward that the death of Reza Bharati 
on Manus Island was the direct result of a series of Australian governments treatment of asylum seekers. So in my view, Buddhists also need to take into account not just the reality of dying, not, 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 not just the kind of death that my brother had, but the context of death generally. What is it that's causing so much death in the world? And what should our response be as Buddhists to that? And of course, Buddhists will also be um, concerned about the unnecessary deaths of many members of other species. And so some Buddhists will become active alongside others in the environmental and animal rights movements. And Mahayana Buddhists usually, or generally, focus on the whole question of becoming vegetarians and vegans so as to avoid um, the killing of animals. Death in all the contextual forms it takes place concern the Buddhist, in my view. Death is not just a medical fact, although medical staff will often be crucial in working in the field. Death in all its contextual forms makes demands on every aspect of our humanity. And so our approach to all suffering, including aging, sickness and death, will need to be from a Buddhist point of view, holistic. We'll need to look at the whole picture and make decisions about that death on the basis of our own ethical stance. I just want to finish um, with a few lines from a commitment that's made to living beings by the sixth century Indian monk Shantideva. And this is a commitment many Buddhists will make for themselves. And it's a commitment I've shared with you before. May I be the medicine and the physician for the sick. May I be their nurse until their illness never recurs. With showers of food and drink, may I overcome the afflictions of hunger and thirst. May I become food and drink. No. Yeah, may I, may I become food and drink during times of famine. May I be an inexhaustible treasury for the destitute with various forms of assistance May I remain in their presence. For the sake of accomplishing the welfare of all sentient beings, I freely give up my body, enjoyments, and all my virtues of the three times. Surrendering everything is nirvana, and my mind seeks nirvana. If I must surrender everything, it is better that I give it to sentient beings. May I be a protector for those who are without protectors a guide for travellers, and a boat, a bridge, and a ship for those who wish to cross over. May I be a lamp for those who seek light, a bed for those who seek rest, and may I be a servant for all, for all beings who desire a servant. To all sentient beings, may I be a wish-fulfilling gem, a vase of good fortune, an efficacious mantra, a great medication, a wish-fulfilling tree, and a wish-granting cow. Just as earth and other elements are useful in various ways to innumerable sentient beings dwelling throughout infinite space, so may I be in various ways a source of life for the sentient beings present throughout space until they are all liberated. And I guess my thought for tonight really is um, what in the way, what are the ways in which you feel that you could be present to the context of when, in which many people die? And it could mean simply working as a volunteer in, in, in palliative care, it could be that. But what about all those other contexts where death is violent, found to be violent and terrible? How might, my practice be an intervention in a sense in those contexts of dying i think i've said enough thank you feel free to unmute yourself <clears throat> if you would like to share anything <clears throat> or um to ask the any questions everyone fall into deep thought 
from the top three. Or else it hasn't made any sense, so nobody knows what to ask. <laughs> no. I think this is a <clears throat> topic that everyone will be facing soon. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, if I Friends. may say a few words, thank you, Bante, for your talk. I felt uh, what you felt. A few years ago, my brother passed away, and the circumstance, well, half past one in the morning, my mobile phone rang on few meters away from where I was sleeping. And then the nursing home called. She said, uh, an Indian lady from Fiji, no English. She said, your brother no breed. No breed, your brother. I said, please call the ambulance straight away. No, what for, she said. He's no breed. <laughs> so I put my Hale's jacket on and drove to the nursing home. And my brother was peacefully lying in the bed. Not smiling, but very peaceful. And from one o uh, two o'clock in the morning, I stayed with the body, with my brother, not just the body. And I thought I'm going to do meditation for, for him. Maybe the merit what I make uh, will help him passing away. And I couldn't meditate. I'm a very old Buddhist and uh, I felt hurt and disappointed in myself. Have you done meditation for him, Bante, for your brother? Oh, yes. But not while the body was there. Um, yesterday, I had to identify the body. So what I did instead was I placed my hand on his head and on his hands and talked to him and um, told him that he was loved and that he needs to let go. And so, yes, but other times I've done sitting in meditation and I did that with my mother as well. Oh, oh you very much stronger and <laughs> a better Buddhist than I am. Uh, but it was so disappointing in myself. Uh, but it's not easy. I, I lost my mother and brother in quick succession. But one thing I must say, they are still with me. And it's a good feeling, uh, good feeling. I have a small shrine with a few Buddhas on it in my bedroom. And I have their pictures next to the Buddha, the Buddha statue. And before I go to bed, I put my hand on it. And uh, it's such a good feeling that I love them. And they helped me a great deal. But dying, Whoever you loved won't die. You can have next door neighbor who gives you a lot of problem and he's already dead. But whatever you love will stay with us forever. Yeah. And sometimes I tell myself, uh, before I went to that beautiful evening, Saturday afternoon, Meredith was there. I was very happy to see her. It was a lovely evening, unreal. I don't know how I deserved it. All the culture from the Buddhist countries. Before that, I had an accident. I nearly died. I don't know how I survived it. So that is with us always. And we are just lucky to be alive. Uh, thanks again. Thank you for the talk, but uh, thanks. Thank you, friend. <laughs> and um, 
uh, they, um, Patricia was expressing um, her heartfelt thanks um, for you deeply for your talk and your love. Uh, completely clear and yet without words in response. <laughs> so that's the uh, comment from Patricia. So Thea was just wondering, like your brother at the um, end of his um, life, do you think that he feels fear of the time approaching? Yes, I do. Um, I was never... Um, I never, I was never able to convince him that. Well, for example, he always felt that he wasn't, he hadn't been a good man, and he was a very good man, and and he he always felt that he had not been a good husband, and I knew perfectly well that in many ways he had been a good husband. For example, um, their neighbour was is a young woman. Um, who is very close to my sister-in-law. And um, they, they used to call her their, or they still call her their adopted daughter. And then not long before he died, my brother admitted to me that he didn't really like her. But he said he did because he knew that she was important to his wife and he didn't want to upset his wife. So in a sense, he lied, I suppose, but he lied because he was a good husband. He lied because he wanted his wife to have this friendship and he wasn't going to do anything that would upset that possibility. And when I said to him, well, that's an example of how you're a good husband, he wouldn't believe me. <laughs> So it didn't really matter what I said. Um, mm. It didn't change his mind. And in the end, I thought, well, uh, there's no point in saying these things to him. All I can do is actually love him. Mm. That's the best I can do now is to actually show that love in, in my affection for him, in being close to him, in doing everything I can to support him and help him. And in the week, the week that he went to the, um, the week that he went to the hospice and the week before he died, only a few days before he died, he had to go to the toilet at home. And so I led him into the toilet and sat him on the toilet. And of course he defecated and he urinated, but also there was a big mass of beetroot colored blood in, in a, and so um, I just asked my sister-in-law, I said to my sister-in-law, it's time to call the palliative care doctor. We can't care for him anymore. And so I cleaned him up and um, got him back into bed. Um, and I look at that time and I think to myself that I was as gentle as I could be in terms of getting him back into bed. And I never, I didn't, I, Worked, I don't know if I worked very hard. I think it just came naturally, but I, I wasn't going to be distressed by what I saw because I didn't want him to be distressed either. Um, and he'd stopped talking by this stage. He could no longer talk. Um, and so, so the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that I was never going to convince him. I was never going to get to teach him meditation, all those things that we had talked about. I was never going to get to do, but what I could do was still in practice, very personal, practical ways, just love him and give that love to him, a bit like loving kindness meditation, really, mm -hmm. and trust that that made a difference in his life. Um, mm -hmm. We're not in, we're not in charge, we're not in control of the circumstances in which people find themselves when they die. We can just do our best to be loving. So much is dependent on their own mind state, their own mental state, their own karma, um, their own view of life and death and those things. Um, the most I could do was be loving and, um, and calm. And, you know, when I'd leave the, we, when I'd leave the hospital um, at the end of my time there, I would always 
you know, stroke his head and kiss him and, and those kind of things and remind him that I was his brother and that I loved him. Mm. That was as much as I felt I could do at the end. Uh, yeah. I'm going to <clears throat> go home to visit my mom next month. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been, I haven't seen her for a long time, uh, you know, since the COVID. <clears throat> yeah, I was just a bit, um, I was just thinking that uh, all this war, like, um, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a person of like a, I'm a doer, like, you know, I, I, so, so sometimes I'm using uh, my doing to express my love, like when, if when, you know, I do a lot of things for her, like when she come here, I will arrange a lot of sightseeing, things like she likes to see, bring her eat this, bring her buy that, you know, so it's like a lot of um, doing things, that's my way of like, uh, like she, she, you know, I mean, she, I love her and then she loved me, of course, but I know that she's getting old and then my, my, my brother just texted me to say that she hasn't showered for three days and then she and then she denied it. I think she probably forgotten or like she's getting tired, she's not moving. So I know that this time when I go back, <clears throat> I won't be able to do a lot of things for her because she, she will be too tired. She won't want to go out and, and tell things. So I was just thinking to myself, it's like, you know, like I was just asking days like, I, I'm not somebody who talk a lot as well <laughs> with my mom, you know, from uh, from an Asian culture that we don't really, I'm, I'm not a good talker as well. So how do you, how do I, you know, <clears throat> show my, um, my, 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 my love and my affection to her if when I'm not doing much for her because I can't do, I, I know that she won't be, I, I won't be doing the same thing that I'd be before like you know bringing her around so i probably could like what frank say like maybe practice that meditation being very present um you know with it in front of her you know to to i don't know <laughs> i'm i'm just i haven't i haven't gone back yet so i'm i'm just thinking that you know my approach could be very different now to make her feel my presence by not doing much <laughs> My first Dharma teacher um, was perhaps was perhaps somebody a number of people in the AEB know, and certainly I know Frank knew her, was yeah. Ayakema. And Ayakema had this little aphorism that she used to say, she used to use, and I've remembered it and used it as a, taken refuge in it um, over many years. She used to say that letting go is the essence of the spiritual life. And with someone that you love, who's getting older and getting sicker, you come to a point where you realize that you have to let go of the way you used to do things. The way that you used to do things is no longer relevant. You have to adapt. If you love the person, and I'm sure you love your mum, of course, you have to adapt to what they need or what they're capable of accepting. And that involves, on your part, letting go of expectations, letting go of the way you have always done things, letting go of that sense that if I don't do it this way, I'm not a good child. Whereas, in fact, letting go is the essence of the good child because you are what? You are um, opening yourself up to new ways of showing the same love. Now, I can't possibly tell you what you actually need to do. I don't know you as that well, and I don't know your mum at all. But I do believe that your love will carry you through. Your love will enable you to see what's necessary, what's possible. And of course, you might make mistakes, Meredith. You might make mistakes, but mistakes are not the end of the world. Mistakes are just the way we learn. So even if you go into your mum and you do something and it irritates her badly, you will have learned something and you won't do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. um, and you will hopefully be open to what's possible now because of the love that you hold for your mum. 
Yes. Now, Emma, her asperism has just carried me through many circumstances. And when you let go, according to Ayakema, then you are experiencing the essence of your spiritual life, the essence of the Dharma life. Very true. <laughs> Letting go. <laughs> Letting go. And in the end, Meredith, we all have to let go completely. Because not only is the person we love going to die, but we are going to die. Yeah. So we have to let go absolutely of everything. And those who love us True. let go of us. Yeah. I think letting go of the old conditions is probably one of the hardest things to do. Yes. You know? Yeah. But, but it's something that life demands of us. We can't, we can't get away from it, that, you know, things are changing all the time and I'm going to have to let go of old habits, even if they're good habits. Yeah, you know, even yeah if that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Is Sujata still there? Yeah. Is, is Sujata still there? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Is she Sujata, still unmute yourself, Sujata. <laughs> Trying. Okay, okay finally, now, yes. I, yes have a lovely, I have a lovely story for you. Yes. When my brother was in the hospice a couple of weeks ago and we were visiting, there was a young Indian nurse who was nursing there. And her name was Sujata. <laughs> when I saw her name, I got very excited. And I said, oh, your name is Sujata. I said, um, I said she's very important to Buddhists, is Sujata. And, <laughs> and, I, and she had no idea of the story of Sujata. So oh. I told her the story of how Sujata helped to revive um, Siddhartha Gautama um, underneath, the, underneath the tree. She fed him the milk rice and he was to go off and to be, uh, become enlightened. And, and I was all kind of excited <laughs> because Sujata is one of my favorite characters in the, in the whole Buddhist story. <laughs> and in my, in my Sangha, every year when it's, um, we celebrate what we call Bodhi Day, which is the day of the enlightenment of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I always cook up a really lovely big um, rice, rice milk pudding that I, and the recipe for it I get from the Hare Krishna cookbook. But I cook it up. And, and we put it into little cups and we feed the Kong, uh, the Sangha feeds each other. We feed each other with, with this um, Sujata rice. Mm -hmm. um, That's nice. And so, so lovely. And I thought of you, Sujata, when I was... Um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Dick. <laughs> and I thought, I must tell her this story. This is a really <laughs> lovely story. <laughs> yeah. okay, I had Sujata, a... you have a chance to... Uh, Offer your rice pudding yes. during the Dana day. <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was, about, I think about fifteen or sixteen, um, the chief monk from uh, Kuala Lumpur came to our little town, and then I made we made some rice and we were offering it, and then all of a sudden he turned around. And he said to me, "Sujata, where's my milk rice?" If you don't give me my milk rice, I can't gain enlightenment. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> he really caught me off guard. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I said, well, um, I don't have goat's milk, but will coconut milk do? <laughs> because we were offering it nasi lemak, which was, you know, coconut milk rice. <laughs> <laughs> he used to tease me about being sujata as well. And he never lets me forget that, you know, if I don't give him the rice, he can't gain enlightenment. So it will be your fault that he's not enlightened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's really responsible for his enlightenment. Yeah. I used to be yeah. terrified of him because he's like tall, big, you know, dark, and, and and he's always so fierce. And so when he comes up to me and he does that, he just scares. <laughs> he just scares me so much. <laughs> I'd be very interested to hear what people thought about that section of the talk tonight on the context of dying. Um, it's easy for us to talk about the experience of dying in, in the privileged way that we do die in Australia, but 
so much of death in the world is within the con within the context of violence and um i'd be interested to hear what people think about that and how they might have experienced that and, and what they might want to do as engaged buddhists to work with that but if you haven't got anything to say that's fine too can i share my yes my yes so we got yes, in yeah. Yeah. Uh, and i'm uh, motivated to say what i'm going to say because of what i just heard from tay and Thank you very much, Tay, for, for the insights that you've uh, shared with us with regards to your, to your experience. I just want to share my own experience um, with regards to my own um, parents. And uh, when my mom uh, and my dad passed away, uh, uh, unlike what is conventional or what I think is conventional <laughs> or common behavior, um, when my, whenever when my parents passed away, uh, I never cried, right? And my mom passed away after a long period of uh, of uh, her experience with uh, being a stroke victim um, mm -hmm. on a wheelchair, and so she she had uh, I guess a bit of a fair bit of suffering in her life, so. Uh, and for that reason and other reasons, I guess, um, I, I, did, I was quite, um, for want of a better word, quite relieved or pleased for her when she passed on. Mm -hmm. And the, the same happens to, to me when my dad uh, passed on, um, uh, when he had a period of, uh, and he was a, he had uh, Alzheimer's, so, and I, saw him during the period when he was uh, suffering from or she, we think he's suffering but uh, <laughs> uh, he had Alzheimer's and he passed on and I, I and again I, I didn't cry uh, at all when my dad um, passed on and now when I reflect back on that and in relation to what you just said uh, Tay uh, um, that uh, we should uh, be able to uh, uh, let go then. In, in that sense, I, I, I guess I was able to let go. That's why I didn't cry. You know, because I was, it was a relief you know, for me. So, yeah, so uh, if uh, I, I share this uh, uh, experience some, um, um, with, you know, uh, with uh, other uh, Sangha too. Uh, and uh, I, I felt just the way, um, you know, I, I think it, it was the right way for me anyway, you know, uh, the way I felt, yeah. So th this, that's my experience you know, that, you know, that I'd like to share with all of you. Thank you. Can I make a response to what you've said? Yes, please. Um, this whole question of crying and giving expression to grief and all of that is mm. even in western culture something relatively recent in the past people would not have um, necessarily expressed their grief by crying it was considered to be well especially those of us who have come from some sort of british background <laughs> it would be we would have to maintain a stiff upper lip as they <laughs> say um and it's only been really in the last maybe 30, 40 years or 50 years that there's been much more emphasis on expressing feelings and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and some people, some people are able to do that and some people are not able to do that. Um, and some people, when they're able to do it, are more able to do it in private than in, in a public space. Um, I think, though, that the truth of the matter is that um, there are innumerable ways to express our grief. We don't do all do it the same way. And um, so, for example, my sister hasn't been able to cry and she feels a little bad about that. But the point is that um, her, her, her method of expressing her grief may well be very different from that um, sort of almost orthodox view of how it 
And the other thing that I wanted to say too is that I completely agree with you that when someone, my mother also had Alzheimer's disease and, and there was just great relief when she died because this terrible thing that was happening to her had come to an end. And I remember one day sitting with my mother um, um, in the nursing home and I was a monk at this time and my mother was very, um, she was a very determined person and she had her fists clenched like this and she was gritting her teeth and I could see that she was fighting death or fighting the next stage that would lead to death. Mm. So I said to her, stop fighting. You are not going to win. Mm. And she stopped. First time she ever did anything I asked her to do, <laughs> but, but she stopped. <laughs> it was really interesting. It, it seemed as though she needed someone to give her permission to die. And that's a really important lesson, that, that whole lesson that death is not a bad thing. Death is just a natural process. And, um, and of course, when you watch someone you love suffer, when they no longer suffer, there is great relief. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfectly natural and perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. myself. And the same is true with my brother. But, you know, he couldn't have gone on living the way he was living. That was terrible. Better for him to die. There's no, there is no, no scandal attached to death. Mm -hmm. I, I think you were perfectly right to talk about the relief that comes when a loved one dies at the end of a, of a very painful or difficult disease. Mm. Mm. So it's nine o'clock now. Thank you so much, Dave, yep. for the lovely life story of you and your brother and your family and the profound teachings that, you know, from the death of your brother. So may he be free from all sufferings and soon realize Nibbana. And we are forever grateful for your services to our community. And for those who wish to provide dana to the teacher, please let us know or indicate your dana in, in your offerings online. And also, I would like to express my gratitude to many of you here who very generously contribute to um, a little fundraising that we organized to get a new laptop for day. So I believe we have um, raised enough fund to get the a uh, new laptop. So uh, very soon they do not have to use their little phone <laughs> to give a Zoom talk to us. So uh, I'm also very grateful. Thank you for um, whoever who has um, many of you here who has contributed uh, to buying this um, laptop for day. Thank you very much. And Day, would you like to give a blessing? And to yeah. Yeah. May the wholesome energy that we have generated here tonight and at any other time be for the benefit of all living beings and be for the benefit of beings who are dying this night. May all beings be well, may all beings be happy, may all beings be free from suffering. May all beings know peace and joy and the causes of peace and joy. And may we continue to walk together the Buddha's path of truth and love. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Pei. Thank you, Pei. And good night, everyone. Thank you for coming.